delusional, unpredictable Ain't love a lot like that from Hong Kong, and Hong Kong for the last generation I'm made the choice. .com, the Republican candidate I did for not have sexual relations with And I realize that this is something he is We're not going to be able to solve our problems if we get distracted by sideshows and carnival barkers. One Republican, one Democrat, and you discuss the issues that matter in today's local, state, national, and global politics. Hosted by Steve Hickson, with co-hosts John Stanberry and Franklin Chansey. This is Backfire. All righty. Good morning, Cleveland. Uh, this is Backfire. Unfortunately, though, this is not Steve Hickson. Uh, this is Lisa Garen. for who? Well, I know. Fortunately for you guys, it is not Steve Hickson. Uh, Lisa Garen here this morning for Steve. He's uh, on the road traveling or will be shortly. So good morning to all of you this morning and uh, glad to have you along. Kind of foggy out there this morning, but you guys made it in okay. So We did a lot of wrecks on the radio, so y'all be careful driving. What radio? Uh, Not this radio, right? Uh, you know, my wife had <laughs> it tuned to another station on the way over here. How oh, dare my her? My goodness. No, I'm just teasing. All right, so uh, what's on the agenda this morning, guys? I know we got a lot of stuff to talk about, uh, but first of all, I think, uh, John, uh, right before we went on the air, you were talking about uh, the Veterans Home. It's a project that's been kind of ongoing here in town for a long time. It's It's been on the work uh, list for a long time. A lot of people have contributed to it. And uh, just this morning, uh, an article in the newspaper that we were all kind of taking a look at. So where are we with this? Well, that's actually part of the facts of this story. We're not sure where we are <laughs> with it. Uh, there has to be state funding. There has to be federal funding. And I think uh, one of the county commissioners was a little upset that the uh, HCI committee, which is the Healthy Community Initiatives, uh, did not give some grant money this cycle to the veterans' home, although they gave sixty thousand dollars the last grant cycle to the veterans' homes that was actually used to do some of the testing on the site to make mm -hmm. sure that it was actually buildable. Uh, but the HCI committee limited resources. They had about I think ninety six thousand dollars this year. It was a thirty thousand dollar request, and at this point in time, the state hasn't committed to it, the federal hasn't committed to it, and I think HCI looked at that and said. Well, we've got other things, very limited resources. We have other things that money can do. And so we're going to skip over it this time until the state and the federal commit to it. And they have another grant cycle coming up in the summer. So it, it's not like this can't be revisited relatively quickly. Uh, but I think Commissioner Hall was a little upset that they got passed over. But I think the HCI committee felt like they were being responsible with the people's money and trying to put the money where it could do the most good right now. Because really and truly... Um, the money that's already been put into the project, it still hasn't really gotten off the ground. So if the speak. state does, and the feds don't come through, that money, you, you don't want to say it's wasted. But but, but it sort of is wasted. It's sort of. <laughs> and well, I think they were trying not to waste any more right now. You've got about several million dollars that have been committed right. by Bradley County, uh, some anonymous donors, as I understand it. Uh, uh, and so there's money that's available there, but I, th I suppose they just want to see if the other parties are going to come through, and if they're not, then we have to take a look at the project and whether it's feasible to do it or not. Well, well, the biggest thing, and the HCI committee has run into this before, one group will say, oh, well, we didn't get our money, but what they miss the fact of is a lot of other groups did get money, and, and the HCI committee is actually a very limited resource. They had $96,000 this year. I think they had over $300,000 in requests. So they're trying to put that money where it can have the most immediate good mm -hmm. for the citizens of Bradley County. And that's going to change from year to year. Right. And they, they have a cycle twice a year, so it's not like it's a long-term put-off on, on any project. It could be readdressed it the next a, time. Re, you know, if in the summer the state has come through with their funding for the Veterans Home and the feds have come through with their indication that they're supporting it, then the money certainly could flow then. Mm -hmm. And more than likely would be at the top of the list for them to take a look at. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, while it might be upsetting today you know in the summer when it's revisited like you said it could definitely be something that makes I, him a little happier than he is here in this article well, i think the hard thing is to say that it's a insult to the veterans not to fund that i, I you know that may politically help one person but it mm -hmm. certainly doesn't help the community 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't see any any motivation at all in this that was anti-veteran. It just looked like smart money management to me. Yeah, but sometimes that's what will happen in any given project. They'll try to pull on the heartstrings through other... Well, except in this case, I, I think that there's a fair degree of unanimity in the community that they would like to see this project succeed and come forward. Mm -hmm. I don't see any real significant opposition to it. And this wasn't, but this wasn't opposition at yeah. all. It was simply yeah. trying to money say management, as he very said. limited resources. Right. Where can we spend our money the wisest at this moment? Right. And unfortunately at this moment, it didn't happen. So, yeah. so again, it's kind of on hold. I mean, I know we've all talked about it, uh, you know, in doing the news and, uh, different um, folks here in the community, like you said, kind of a, think it's a, an important project. But again, it just doesn't seem, and it does take time. Any kind of project, especially of that magnitude, is going to take a little bit of time to get everything kind of in place. And then once it gets in place, of course, then it'll... Well, there were some shocks in this. You know, at one point we were higher on the list, and then the next year we dropped down. I'm not sure that was ever explained uh, from a federal level as how your priority actually decreases. I, I assume some imminent action could happen somewhere else that bumps someone ahead of us, but it actually seemed like maybe there was some politics involved. But that's on the federal level. Isn't there always politics involved? Uh, on any level unfortunately i guess there is <laughs> in most stuff i think just about so uh speaking of politics uh president obama has been busy over the course of the past uh few days the other day in uh murder apolis as i read it to be when he was in minneapolis uh talking about his gun control proposed gun control laws and things that are going to happen so where do we stand guys there's been a lot of uh local reports about SROs in the schools, a lot of sheriffs taking a stand on how they feel about gun control, a lot of residents even taking a stand on, hey, you know, we're going to defend ourselves. So uh, with all of that over the course of the past week, um, what are your thoughts on that? Seems like there's some, I'm not sure the word's consensus, but some emerging trends that are coming out of those discussions. Uh, from what I've seen, uh, there's... Uh, not much traction behind the so-called assault weapons ban. It doesn't seem like it has any significant prospects of passing. Uh, it does look like there may be the possibility of a, an agreement on uh, a, a federal backgrounds check for firearm purchases. Um, and the jury's kind of still out on the expanded magazines uh, on that. And that's sort of the three main trends that I see uh, that's been going on in the discussions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, there's also a lot of support for for having some form of armed guards in the schools as well, among among parents especially. Uh, you know, and I don't hear any real opposition to the concept. Uh, the question is, is that going to be something that's funded locally or, or, or federally? That's uh, the issue, I think, that has to be resolved. Uh, I would dis I disagree a little bit in that I, the NR or not NRA, the NEA, some of the teachers organizations have actually come out against it, but I think they've been overwhelmed by parents who've mm -hmm. said, you know, it seems logical that if we had a guard on the school grounds, it might help. Well, I mean, we have experience to some degree in this area with SROs, right. although in fairness, uh, many of the SROs in uh, Cleveland and Bradley County were of the habit of not wearing firearms during their day-to-day -day job. They may have had them on site, but they weren't wearing them typically yeah. uh, in a lot of the places. That's not true for all of them. Uh, so that's uh, that has some impact, I suppose. But I think having exposed the community to the SRO process here, there's probably a fair amount of support for it now. Well, I think that what Franklin just said actually speaks a lot to what some of people like myself that are strong gun supporters have said all along this is a cultural and demographic problem because when we placed the SROs in the schools years ago mostly I think we, we originally put them in the high schools we're looking for some control among some fights among the students maybe some uh, drug trafficking that might have been going on trying to figure out who's doing it which locker it's in and over the course of the last uh, certainly 10 years but maybe even 20 years now we've got parents coming and killing children that they checked mm -hmm. out we've got people trying to enter the school so not carrying a gun when we started the program probably made sense because we were trying to attack a different problem mm -hmm. the problems have changed yeah the problems have definitely changed um, there was an article in the banner yesterday about uh, the Cleveland Board of Education, the members adopted a resolution stating school resource officers should be the only individuals with weapons on school property. 
of course, that doesn't address, like you said, parents coming onto the property or um, a teenager or a high school student coming onto the property with something in his backpack or just like the Connecticut uh, shootings when, um, you know, the young individual came in and broke through the door. So, you know, are locks really the answer? Are the guns for the SROs only the answer? Probably not. Well, I, I actually think that that's a rather knee-jerk reaction on the Cleveland School Board's part. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that they should have eventually supported uh, some of the ideas about training and, and perhaps arming a, a teacher. But I certainly think you wait until a program is put forward and you see what the parameters of that program are, what the training of that program are. Perhaps you limit it to someone who's got 10 years of armed uh, forces service. Well, I would submit to you that someone who served 10 years in the Marines is probably a pretty well-trained individual mm -hmm. with the use of guns. So I think that was a little premature on their part. Do you think they felt forced? No, I think that's a, a, a philosophical knee-jerk reaction. Okay. Because, you know, with everything that's going on in all the schools and, you know, we see it on the news every day, we hear about it, uh, you know, people are talking about it at the water cooler and, you know, parents are getting together with their parent and community, you know, programs and they're talking about it and what to do about it. And it just almost felt like in my mind that they almost felt like the community might have been forcing their hand a little bit to make some sort of decision in regard to the guns on the school property. Well, you had a lot of people... Uh, in local government who were not necessarily involved in education began to very vocally tout various ideas uh, and, and respectfully I would say that those folks may not have as much experience about what goes on in a, an educational campus as the folks in the educational community do. But, but I've it done wasn't a lot about of, edu I've, education, I've a lot of, it was about safety well, and protection. But, okay, but I've done a lot of work at some of the elementary schools that involve some of this. You mentioned a terrible incident that happened several years ago when a parent did check some children out and, and mm -hmm. killed them. Uh, there was an SRO on duty that day. Mm -hmm. The SRO didn't know that this person was going to do that. Nobody knew it. Mm -mm. The other thing that you f frequently see in school situations is that you have uh, parents sometimes who come to the school not planning on there being problems or trouble, but then something happens or a discussion takes place with a teacher or a principal that doesn't go the way they wanted it to, and tempers escalate. Mm -hmm. That's where and I think the question comes in of whether you want to make it illegal for people to carry those firearms onto the campus to begin with. Yeah, but but because, Franklin, this... Because tempers do take Right, over. but this program wasn't aimed at oh, that. I know, this, but we're the, having Their a bigger statement discussion. was aimed at the idea that you could train and arm a teacher. Mm -hmm. and, and my question would be, especially since I, I, I went to school at Cleveland Junior High, that building is now part of the high school complex. Mm -hmm. If you have an SRO officer at the back side of the old Cleveland Junior High building and something begins to happen at the front entrance of the old Cleveland High School building, mm -hmm. how long is it going to take him to get from one side of that campus to the other side of the campus? Too long. <laughs> I mean, so, honestly. I, my point just was I think that they could have waited until these programs were fleshed out. And I wouldn't have had a problem at all once the program was fleshed out if they had said, you know what, we don't want to participate in this. Because that's actually the way the programs were designed. Mm -hmm. They were going to allow local opt-in or opt-out, which is very flexible. I just think it's rather... Uh, poor decision making to opt out before you've even seen what the program looks like. Yeah. And maybe they, I mean... <laughs> This is going to sound really bad, but we know they can always go back and say, maybe we didn't have all the facts. Maybe now we'll have a new resolution that says, here's where we're going it's, with it's this. A, it's a, uh, obvious on the surface you don't have all the facts because right. the legislation hadn't the even decision. come forward. Right, right. Yeah, and it's been, it has been a big topic of discussion, and it's been, you know, the state level and, you know, lots of uh, sheriffs around different areas. I think even the sheriff here in Bradley County uh, stated that he wasn't necessarily for a lot of the gun control um, pieces is, that you the, talked about the police chief okay the police chief did that and well, i think the sheriff might have done hammond, it too, hammond and uh, jim ruth hamilton county and, and bradley are the only two tennessee sheriffs that have gone on apparently there's a 
and I'm not sure the name, conservative sheriffs for liberty or something yes. like that, uh, that are opposing. The, this is bringing up, the, the president's position is bringing up some issues of states' rights as well. There are states that are saying, if we believe that, that say, an executive action is unconstitutional, we have a charge to uphold the Constitution, and we're not going to well, enforce that's a, that. That's a, uh, irrespective of this issue, that's a dangerous notion. Well, I some thought of we, us think I thought states' we, rights I thought is we, a good uh, notion. I thought we, uh, you know, ended that discussion 150 years ago. Uh, there is something called the Supremacy Clause in the United States Constitution. Uh, it's for the United States Supreme Court to decide what's constitutional or not. There's well, a the method. There's a method for bring, saying that he would decide what was constitutional. There's a That's method. A quote from his lips. Well, that doesn't stop anybody from taking the president to court. That's either what on these that point. sheriffs are saying. No, that if they're saying we're not done, going to. We're going to decide ourselves what's constitutional, and we're going to act accordingly. That's I, a far different thing. I think we all do that to a certain degree, don't you think? Well, I don't know, Franklin. Let me ask you a question. If, if one of these sheriffs serve part-time in the uh, Air Force National Guard and um, he was asked to fly oh I don't know maybe a drone and assassinate a U.S. citizen as the White House has now said they have the right to do should he refuse that order based on constitutional well, first of all, grounds? I, I, I'm, I'm happy to have that discussion with you because it's a very big issue that deserves a lot of attention and deserves a lot of thought and analysis. I saw a lot of people surprisingly from both camps who were taking unusual positions on that issue over the last couple of days that's what the order that you're talking about says first of all uh, first of all it's not talking about united states citizens in tennessee and alabama it's talking about united states citizens who might be in for example in afghanistan actually it doesn't specify that at well, all frankly. that's what it's being but it doesn't about. specify that at all second of all uh, somebody gave me this uh, example yesterday and I just throw it out for you know what your thoughts about it are and I, I, I frankly don't have my position really thought out well about this. Well, you issue. had a position on torture but you don't have well, a position on, a on assassination. On Let, let's back up for a minute. If in World War II a United States citizen went to Germany put on a German army uniform and fought against American troops would you have said that our government can't target them? Well, actually, that's an excellent comment, Franklin, because that would have made them an enemy combatant, an actual member of the other well, army. The problem with al-Qaeda is they are not a nationality. They are not an army. They are just an individual You don't collection. think we're at war with them? Well, I don't know. Your president said we're not. I ask you what you think, John. Well, Franklin, I, here's yeah. my problem with this. I don't have a problem with enhanced interrogation attempts. My problem is with the liberal left that excoriated President Bush for uh, waterboarding someone, but they're perfectly okay with the president deciding not only to kill terrorists, but now he can kill United well, States citizens. Well, I think citizens. by definition we're talking about somebody who is a terrorist, though, aren't Actually, we? Actually, I'll read it to you directly. It said, killing of American citizens if they're believed to be, quote, senior operational leaders or a associated force even if there is no intelligence indicating they are engaged in an active plot to attack the U.S. So well, now if, me, somebody, me, if somebody minute, is actively President working Bush, in the al-Qaeda structure, I know, the is problem. that actively involved in attacking the U.S.? Well, I don't know, Franklin. You said President Bush couldn't look at their library records if they were actively a member of al-Qaeda. No, but I this president can blow them out I of the air. I said I'm not comfortable with him doing Well, are you comfortable blowing them out of the air then? I don't know, John. That's a really interesting question. Well, it's, and it's amazing something that I to don't me, have a knee jerk response to. It's amazing to me how how ugly people were to President Bush over library records, but everybody's taking a oh, let's wait and see a, attempt at the killing of US citizens. Well, first of all, I don't think that snooping into people's personal lives is the same thing as protecting national security well, number wait, wait. one well let me ask you Frank, number the two person that he's going to target to kill how does he know he's a member of al-qaeda well according to the order they had to have actionable information well wouldn't they have to snoop into i mean, I mean think about what you well, just said you, know you can't you know snoop what? into their personal lives to find by, out by, if they're al-qaeda but John, somehow if we magically divine that they're going to the cleveland public library well let me ask you a question is obama using a ouija board to decide who's in al-qaeda it's a good question as I said, it's worth having a serious conversation about. I wish you'd join me in that. 
Because all you really want to do is do what your party always does, no, which I'm is not. just shoot at Obama no I'm matter what. No, I'm telling you that when he adopts your position, is, you're against it. I am telling you that this is so amazing to me that the the left can fuss about President Bush looking at oh, library hold it, hold records, it, hold it, hold but it, they minute, can't fuss minute, about no. Obama last targeting week, U.S. citizens. Last week, and for months on end before that, you drone on and on and on about the liberal media looking out for Obama. Believe, Who broke this story? Actually, NBC, NBC News broke this story. Because they were given a copy of the memo by you're, a senator. You're, you're lead number one example of the people you say are looking out for the president are the ones who are leading this investigation. Well, the difference And of, we just found out about it 36 hours well, ago. Frankly, and you already have w- worked out your position and the, know exactly what The difference what the in are. me droning on and on is my droning doesn't involve a Hellfire missile who kills U.S. It citizens. It also doesn't involve... 10,000 American troops on the ground getting shot at. That's a morally complicated issue, too. Oh, you mean like the troops that we're going to send into northern Africa now with this president? I don't know. Well, are you going to are you going to jump all over him like you did Bush? Are you suggesting what do you what's your idea? Look, Frank, See, here's the thing. I didn't fuss you guys at Bush shoot sending from the troops. Hip. No. Say, I didn't here's say here's what's it was wrong. wrong, here's what's wrong, but you never have a plan for what to do. Franklin I said I want some consistency. I'm not. I didn't say I was criticizing this. Well, I'm saying why it aren't you? Like you're I'm saying it. why aren't you criticizing it? Because I don't have all the facts. Well, yet, you didn't no. have all the facts on looking at library books either, but you criticized it. But that discussion went on over a six-month, year-long period. Well, John. the reason this hadn't gone over six months is because they kept it secret. And matter of fact, he walked out of a press conference yesterday and refused to answer questions well, about it. Well, there are national security issues involved. You well, know that. Jay Carney said he couldn't answer questions because it would require a lawyer. Last time I checked, the president was a lawyer and a constitutional authority. But he couldn't answer any questions about it. Well, there's an old adage that uh, a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. <laughs> well, I certainly think that would apply to President <laughs> I don't, Obama. I don't, I don't, thank you, for, I don't, thank I don't, you I, for telling us that that applies to President Obama. I, I, I agree I with you on that. I don't frankly. imagine you do, many, you do many root canals on yourself either. <laughs> oh, is it time to ring the bell yet? Okay. Uh, Obama also moving away from the gun control, moving away from the... Uh, Killing is, of U.S. citizens. Yes, thank you. Uh, we can talk about that plenty because there's plenty of that going on as well. But um, he is also planning to hit uh, folks, smokers, with huge penalties. Did you guys uh, see this report? And it begs to, I guess, bring the question up again. Should people drawing disability, uh, any form of unemployment, any kind of uh, help from the government? Are you talking about the the, the higher premium portion of Obamacare mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. smokers? Yes. And, I mean, not necessarily just for smokers, really. I think they're going to look at several different things. And, and it does bring the question up to, to us to look at this morning. Should those folks be held to a different standard than they are now? Should there be drug testing for individuals that are on disability and, and food stamps? And should there be other testing involved because of this? Well, there's a lot, lots of different issues that you just raised there. Um, as I understand the proposal, and uh, I can't say that I've read the entire thing, but as I understand it, um, the rule that's being discussed would allow private insurance companies mm-hmm. to charge a higher premium. 50% for, higher. For, for smokers. Right. Uh, out of the view that that produces a tremendous amount of the health care costs mm-hmm. there. That's 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 the question. And in many cases, that also then translates into indigent care mm-hmm. that's being provided by taxpayers anyway. So that's 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 the outline for it. So that's the first part of it. Um, you know, smoking rates are falling in, in America. Um, that's been going on for, I don't know, 10, 15 years significantly. Uh, uh, most most of us would say that's a good thing. I think from a health standpoint, some teen rates have gone up though, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that is unfortunate. Um, so, I suppose from a philosophical standpoint, you have the question of whether you have an objection to the government um, taking control of that. Well, it's, I don't know if taking control is the right way, but it, there is a there is a social engineering element to government policy that encourages one behavior over another. Now, philosophically, there are people who have disagreements with that. Um, I've sort of always taken the position that if if your behaviors and choices don't affect anybody else, then you're free to do anything you want to do. Uh, 
but that's the issue. But when it starts affecting other people, then... I mean, is it any different than, you know, a restaurant or a building saying, we don't allow smoking here? Mm -hmm. That affects somebody's rights, too. Uh, Government does that frequently. You can't smoke on government property or you can't smoke on your government job or something like that. That happens a lot. Uh, I don't know that there's any legal difference between those two. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as I say, there's philosophical disagreements between different folks. But uh, certainly the intent is a healthy community intent, uh, whether you like it or not. Well, my my problem here... Is, is there's two different arguments to talk about here. I, I'm not opposed to that. I've said that all along. I think it's wrong for me as a non-smoker to get a deduction because I think the rate ought to be based on the smoker mm-hmm. and, and he ought to have to pay extra for that poor choice. Mm-hmm. My problem with this is this is in direct opposition to how the president sold the program. And I'm not complaining about this decision. So before Franklin says I'm criticizing the president, I'm not on that level. But he came out and he told people that no one was going to get an increase in premiums. Well, we knew at the time that that simply wasn't true. Right. You couldn't cover these people without charging more. And now he's basically, my problem is no one's making him admit that what he said before was either incorrect or just not true. The second problem here is this is going to disproportionately hit the lower income people. Now, he spent an entire election cycle demonizing the 1% and how horrible it was that they weren't paying their fair share. What does this do? The poorest of our people are the highest percentage of people that smoke. This is going to disproportionately affect them. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that's wrong because what happens, what makes people change bad habits is negative consequences. But again, it's against the very rhetoric that he ran on. So I have a real problem with the fact that he can say one thing one day and another thing the other day. Even when I agree with some of what he's saying, I just want someone to be straight with me. Well, and I think, like you said, there are several arguments that you can look at here. That, of course, is one of them because, indeed, he said, yeah, the premiums are not going to change. It's never going to go up. It's always going to be, you know, okay. But I think uh, when you look at that, you can you really just target smokers? I mean, can you well, not target like... the problem is, like, like Franklin referenced, you open the door for a lot of social engineering, you know, and, well, and who decides what's well, good exactly. and what's bad. Well, because first if of you're all, an alcoholic... First of and, all, your, your private insurance companies were already doing this. Number one. Right. Because okay. they do. I mean, if, if you, you filled out a private insurance application, yes. the question is, are you a smoker is right. on there? Right. So the government's not doing anything to anybody who already had health, health insurance that the health insurance companies weren't doing already. But they're now, mandating But it. they were shading. I, I agree, uh, Franklin. But you also uh, know that they were trying to balance that as best they could so they didn't get sued. Uh, T- Fifteen years ago, they would have been sued by a smoking group mm-hmm. for discrimination. Well, mm-hmm. the, sh- the tide has shifted in American culture, so now we feel better about it. But this is the government codifying that. Well, uh, even so, the insurance companies had always contended that they needed to be able to do this. Why? Because smokers were taking a disproportionate amount of the benefits from health insurance. Mm-hmm. It's just a fact. Now, John mentioned that it affects the poor. It does, but it's also true that health care for the poor is a huge extra cost because uninsured people who were poor are also the very people who were putting off preventative care, who were not going to a primary care physician but if and were waiting until they got sick and going to an emergency frankly, room and then afford, us having to pay for how it. How do they afford the coverage now if they have to pay 50% more in premiums? And again, I'm not arguing against it, but my point is well, there's I think no the, logic I think here. the intent is to provide an incentive to not smoke. Well, I know, but here's my problem. That's the theory. The intent earlier when this was all pushed aside was to get someone reelected. That's what offends me. Well, first of all, uh, Obamacare was passed in the first year of the Obama presidency, not right before the election. it was a it was a promise to his base. He did it. He told people it wouldn't cost more. It has. Well, that's not entirely clear at this point, John. Oh, it's entirely clear. No, it isn't. Well, you know what? Let's put it this way. Nobody except the 1% was going to get a tax increase. But on January 1st, when people got their first paycheck, it became entirely clear that we all got a tax increase. Well, what happened is a temporary tax cut that was given by the president and pushed by the president expired. Well, did he fight for that? 
Did he fight for what? He fought for that temporary tax cut. That's right. But, you know, I didn't hear him fight for it, frankly. I didn't hear him lament the, the fact class. that everybody's uh, taxes went up on their paycheck. You had tons of people who were supporters of the president that got their first paycheck this year and went, what in the hell happened? <laughs> Some of us. Yeah, we definitely did that. All right, guys, that's a good uh, breaking point here. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We'll be right back uh, with more great hot topics on Backfire this morning. You're listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson. We'll be right back after this. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Short on cash? Check into cash gives you more money for your title and the lowest title loan rate anywhere. If you already have a title loan, ask Check into Cash about paying it off. No credit check, no run around. Check into cash won't slow you down. Check into cash loans you the most for your title. Get the lowest rate on a title loan and the most money only at Check into Cash. Check into Checking the cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Oh, yeah. Checking the cash is your money machine. Get on up and get down. For any proof of lower rate on similar title loan restrictions apply, visit checkintocash.com for the store nearest you. Dr. Christopher Chase with Associates in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Now in Cleveland on Wednesdays at 2350 Okoy Street. Call 624-0021 for an appointment now. Certified by the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Offering facial procedures, body contouring, skin resurfacing, and specializing in breast augmentation, including the newest transumbilical or belly button augmentation for less scarring, ladies. Call Dr. Christopher Chase for an appointment now, 624-0021. The Bald Headed Bistro has a brand new menu offering more value for your dollar. The Bald Headed Bistro, Western Fine Dining in the heart of the South. The best bar and happy hour in town. The Bald Headed Bistro in the Village Green, Cleveland. Are you looking for the best beer and cigarette prices in Bradley County? Well, look no further than Tom's Fuel Mart. That's right, look for the red and yellow signs. 25 feet from the street, four locations in Cleveland that serve you at Tom's Fuel Mart number four. That's right there near the Cleveland Speedway. You get the best homemade biscuits, sandwiches, and that includes the best fried bologna sandwiches in town. Just ask the Matador. That's right, Tom's Fuel and Mart, where you can find 100% gasoline. That means no ethanol, folks, for your lawn mowers and small engines. Do it. With locations on South Lee Highway, Wildwood, and North Okoy, Tom's Fuel Mart with the red and yellow sign 25 feet from the street is ready to serve you. Yee-haw! When you buy or sell or pawn, you can't go wrong at U.S. Money Shops. When money's tight, you'll be all right. Money shops. 